Hello, I'm Jonathan Smith. I'm the lead pastor at One Church TO, and you're listening to the teaching time from our weekend gathering. We're an imperfect community of over 70 nationalities and five generations who are attempting to follow and shine Jesus in the greater Toronto area. Our vision, it's so simple. We want to help people from all walks of life know God, love people, and in turn, impact our city for good. We've designed these weekends to be meaningful, challenging, and encouraging, and I hope that's what you get from listening. Well, thanks, Pastor Matt, and welcome again to One Church TO, and welcome to The Good Life, week two of our kickoff series. Last week, Pastor Jessica, Matt, and Jerry, they helped us understand that the good life is a life that will be lived when we get to the end of our lives, that we'll look back and we'll say, man, that was a good life. And there are three things that make up the good life. There's the act of surrender that makes up the good life. And we have the imagery that Pastor Jessica gave us of an altar. And the idea is simply this. Everything that we have belongs to God. And so we live in a place and stasis of surrender. Here's the beautiful thing about surrender that maybe we may, may, may not may understand is connected with it. The more surrendered our life is, the freer our lives are, the less attachments and things that control us. So she helped us understand to live a surrendered life. And then Jerry helped us to understand how to live a generous life and that one of the marks of a good life is a generous life. And he challenged us to set generosity goals. If you haven't already done that, I'm going to encourage you, set some generosity goals. You can't take it with you. So why not invest it to the people that God has around you? And then Pastor Matt helped us to understand the missional life, that there's a purpose, a greater purpose to our life. And that's what helps us understand the good life. And of course, our mission, if you're a follower of Jesus, is to invite as many people into the good life as possible. And he used this catchphrase that I've been using all week, come with me. In fact, uh, my wife Shelly and I, when we have the opportunity to to go for a walk together, we often spend our time praying, and we've been praying these things over the people we know in our lives, that they would live a more surrendered life, a generous life, and one that's on mission. So this week, we're going to turn our attention from from, uh, the individual living the good life, and we're going to, shortly in a few minutes, uh, Pastor Matt and Jerry are going to join me, and we're going to give you five bold moves, five bold moves that we as a team have been discerning that God is leading this church in to do over the next three to five years. But before we go there, and I want to broaden your idea through, we're going to do a little exercise to broaden your vision of what the church could be. Because the fact is, everyone that's listening today, including myself talking today, we all have an idea. We all have a vision for our church, what our church should be and what our church should be doing. And often that vision is made up of spoken as well as unspoken biases. We all have biases. And you know, the sooner you acknowledge your bias, the easier it is to navigate uh, whatever it is we're dealing with or making decisions. But we all have biases. And in the church, traditionally, historically, from the very inception of the church, the bias that most kind of controls the decision-making in the church is often a bias between the past and the future. It's a, it's a bias between the past and the future. That's a tension that we need to navigate. So we're going to have a conversation about that. And we're going to, if you have a Bible, you can jump to Acts 15. We're going to get there in just a moment, but I want to give you a, a head start to find it. See, the past and the future shows up in, in uh, the church or in your life this way. We're, we all have what was, it's our past, what is, our present, and what will be our future. Here's what I know is true of you. Most of us don't want to live in what is. <laughs> if you're young, you're always trying to live in what will be. You ever notice that when you're young? When I was 16, I was just like, I can't wait to get my license so I don't have to depend on my parents to drive me places or get things. And then, then I couldn't wait to be 18. And then I couldn't wait to be 21. And then I couldn't wait to get a job and get my own money. You, you know that whole rite of passage thing. Because what is is often complex uh, uh, we can feel stuck in the present reality. And, you know, as you age, and I, I'd certainly be in this category as I've aged and I'm middle-aged, uh, we, we start to live in what was. Because what will be and what is, is what was is an escape from what is. It's an escape from our present reality. And as you age, the world seems more complex, it seems even more disturbing, and so different from what we've known that we can start to feel lost, so we retreat into what was. 
Here's what happens as we age. We go back to the past, what was, and we do it to escape what is, but we also do it to try to control what will be. There's a sense of wanting to control that. When you're young, you, you want to escape to what will be. Now here's, listen, uh, uh, no, no cost for this, but if you're younger, uh, a valuable lesson that experience in life begins to teach you is this. Your what, what is right now will someday become your what was. What you're doing right now will someday be your past. And depending on how you navigate the present will depend on whether your future will feel heavy and will drag you back or it will fuel your future. So I, I, I want to invite you, because here's the thing that's interesting in Scripture before we get to Acts 15. You know, the prophet Isaiah talks about the future and he talks about the past, and so does the prophet Mo Moses, or the, the person of Moses in Scripture. Isaiah says these famous words. Many of you would know this if you've grown up in church. Isaiah says this, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, he was referencing the exodus, this incredible moment where the children of God are delivered from slavery and captivity. And he's saying, forget the former things. Don't think about the past. Why? Why would Isaiah say something like that? It doesn't even make sense, especially where Moses would say the exact opposite. Moses said this to the children of God on the moment they crossed the Red Sea. He says, this is the day to remember, can you say it with me? Forever. Remember it forever. The day you left Egypt, the place of your slavery, today the Lord has brought you out by the power of his mighty hand. So who's right? Is Moses right? Oh, remember the past. Or is Isaiah right? Forget the past. Well, the, it's not an easy answer. It's because it really depends. It really depends. If you're living in the past, if you're holding on to the past, if you're trying to recreate the past in the present, then Isaiah is your man. We need to forget those things that have passed. Here's why. If, if you're constantly looking in the rear view, veer, rear view mirror of your life at a past exodus moment, you're never going to see a future exodus moment coming at you. You're going to miss what's coming at you because you're too busy staring at what's behind you. Uh, let me illustrate it this way. Uh, every vehicle has a windshield, and the windshield is exponentially larger than your rearview mirror. Why? Because what's happening in front of you is way more important than what's happening behind you. Uh, and it's the same in the church. Uh, what happened in our past is not nearly as important as what will happen in our future. Whoa, Pastor Jonathan, I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like that. Well, yeah, stay with me for a few minutes. I'll qualify it in just a moment. But, but we need to understand, friends, that, that when, when, when Moses says, remember the past, and this might be our, where we go, the past really matters, and the past does matter. But we need to understand that it depends. It really depends on how we're treating the past. See, if the past has become an anchor, if that past has become an anchor, now I grew up on the East Coast in the Atlantic Ocean. The city I grew up in has got a big port. Big ships are always coming in and out. And an anchor is really important. An anchor keeps you in one spot. An anchor can, can keep you when the waves are going, keeps you moored and keeps you maybe safe or sheltered. But we need to remember, anchors, uh, boats were never designed to be anchored. Boats are designed to move. And just as humans aren't designed to be anchored or churches aren't designed to be anchored, we're designed to move. So if your past has become an anchor instead of an oil tanker, something that is fueling you, see, the past can either anchor us or it can fuel us. We have a choice in that. But if it's become an anchor and it's not fueling you, then you need to forget the former things and do not dwell on the past. We need to move on. We need to move forward in life. Friends, some of us are so anchored to past decisions. Maybe you made some bad decisions in your past and you're still living with them. Some of us are anchored to previous glorious moments in our life that we can't see a glorious moment coming at us in this life because we're too anchored to our past. And what that does is keep us in the harbor of life. And we don't, unless we pull up anchor and begin to explore and live forward in life, the past will always hold us back instead of fuel us forward. You, you know, 85% of churches in, in North America are either plateaued or declining. Why? 
because they're anchored to a past method, a past mode, or a past move of God. And they can't embrace what is coming at them. Now, we come by it honestly. Hey, it's okay. We come by it honestly. Just like we all have a bias about an uh, unspoken biases and, and even spoken biases, in Jesus' day, they did too. And the people that surrounded Jesus, they had a bias of what they thought the Messiah should be doing. And they expressed it often. And they were disappointed in Jesus because he didn't live according to their bias. He came to do what he was going to do. And in the early church, it, it erupts again. People had an idea of what the church should be. And in Acts 15, it's kind of like the first annual members meeting in Acts 15. It's a pretty epic chapter. It's one of my favorite chapters in the New Testament. I've probably spoken on it a few times in our church's history because it's so informative and helpful for understanding how do we navigate and how do we hold the past and future together so the past benefits the future and the future is informed from the past. Well, here's what's happening. After the death and resurrection of Jesus, the church began to grow rapidly. Many Jews became followers of Jesus. And this was exciting for the Jewish sect, this, this new way, this new church, this new Christian way, this new followers of Jesus. It was exciting because it fit their element of understanding and their paradigm. It was what they expected and what they were hoping for. But something happens. Something happened. There's what we would call a new development in the present reality, in the what is. There's a new development that happens. What happens is so important that it requires a decision. It requires a decision. Do we stay anchored to our past or do we fuel our future from our past? Which is it going to be? Well, there's this group that in Acts 15, that they want to stay anchored to their past. They want where, where we've been to be the priority. And there's this other group in Acts 15 that they want to fuel the future from their past. So they want to pull up anchor, but they want to hold on to where we've been, who we've been, but they want to move into the future. The problem is, and the problem that was kind of infecting the church at the time, is that Gentiles. Now, if you're new to church and maybe new to the Bible, what is a Gentile? Well, I'm a Gentile. A Gentile is a non-Jew. And this did not fit their understanding. This did not fit their past understanding of what would be happening. They saw themselves as a Jewish movement and located in a certain geographical location. But the Holy Spirit had a different plan for the church. And so what was initially local and homogenous, the Holy Spirit made global and diverse. And this caused the present to run into their past and it required a decision for their future. And whenever the past, whenever the past collides with the present, a decision will always need to be made for the future. You can delay a decision, but that's a decision. A decision always needs to be made from the future whenever the past collides with the present. You know, for example, I was thinking about uh, this week that in 2018, we launched something called One Church The Old Eyes. And actually, it's what you're enjoying right now. It's this moment we have right here. And I remember this church made a significant investment in innovation in 2018. Significant investment in, in innovation in 2018. And you know what's hard with all of that? And I, I think even back then, because I heard from many of you, you, didn't, you thought it was nice, but you didn't think you'd ever need it. You didn't think you wanted it. <laughs> it wasn't, I don't think any of us were thinking we'd choose a digital gathering over a physical gathering back in 2018. Uh, but what was interesting, and, and we need to remember, it always takes a lot of faith, a lot of faith to step in a future we don't understand. It takes a lot of faith to step into a future that we do not understand. And I'm so thankful for the board of deacons of this church who, who trusted me. Really, this crazy pastor with this idea that, you know, that I, I, you know, would this hurt our attendance? Would this, there's a lot of fear around, and there always is fear around taking a step of innovation. But they trusted me, and they trusted our crazy team that was trying to innovate and move forward. And, but we weren't motivated because we didn't know about COVID-19 at the time. We didn't launch this because we thought there's going to be a pandemic coming, and people won't be able to get in a physical gathering, so let's get digital you know, we didn't do that. We didn't know it was coming. We did it because we saw what was going on in the world. We saw what was coming. We knew this, that we had the possibility of reaching people that we would never reach through a physical expression because it was more localized. 
And just like the Holy Spirit did in that first century church, we took a big step of faith to say, maybe God has a bigger plan here for us. And as we reemerge in physical gatherings, because on, on October 10th, on Thanksgiving weekend, we're going to open up the doors of this facility and we're going to have physical gatherings once again. You could be tempted, especially if you've been a part of our church previously in physical gatherings, to think, great, we're going to go back to our past. But the thing is that the world that existed before COVID no longer exists. It no longer exists. This vision uh, has expanded. And really, you can see how God, isn't it amazing how God and you jump in the chat room and affirm this if this has been your experience, how God can cause even bad things to work together for good. And out of something as terrible as COVID, he's taken this local church and he's made it a, 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 a Toronto-wide church. I don't know if you know this, but only 15% of our church lives in the Agent Court area. Only 15% of this church lives in geographical aging court. We're no longer an aging court church. We're a Toronto-based church. And so many people call our church home, some that have joined us through the pandemic. And here's, here's, here's the interesting thing. We have decisions to make whenever our past collides with our present that will inform and shape our future. In Acts 15, the same thing is going on. The past was coming to bear against the present that was going to affect the future. The only reason I'm here is because of Acts 15. The only reason most of you are even listening to me today is because of Acts 15, because something significant happened. There are two groups of people in this passage. One group that wants to remain as they were, and another group that wanted to move forward. And, you know, there, and there was a little bit of a conflict. You can see the tension in Acts 15. It's pretty interesting. You get Paul and Barnabas and, and the apostle Peter on one side, and you have some of the Jewish uh, heritage uh, leaders on the other side, and it's a little bit of a moment. It's very interesting in Acts 15. So those who are first to the table want the Gentiles to behave like them. They want them, if you're going to sit at the table with us, we want you to adopt the 613 commands of the Old Testament. So they want them to become more Jewish in order to be a part of it. Now what's interesting, fascinating, is the Apostle Peter stands up and speaks you got to understand, this is the last time he speaks in the book of Acts. This is the last time he's mentioned in the book of Acts. This is a man who has walked with Jesus. This is a man who walked on water. This is the man who has been a part of bringing the gospel and the, whole, the, the, the Holy Spirit to Cornelius, to other Gentiles. He's had a vision of this, and he takes the microphone, and he's about to do something amazing. He's about to leverage all of his coin all of his experience, all of his credibility, all of his leadership for the future. He's about to empty his cup. I love this quote by Andy Stanley. Andy Stanley said this, as leaders, we are never responsible for filling anyone else's cup. Our responsibility is to empty ours. You know, I think about that mom, dad, grampy, granny, <laughs> leader, boss, whatever your role is in life. I've exhausted myself as a pastor, and maybe you have in life, trying to fill somebody else's cup up. When I grabbed hold of this and realized it's not my responsibility to fill someone's cup, it's my responsibility to empty my cup. Peter is leaning into this moment, and he's leveraging all that he's experienced. He's leveraging all the goodwill he has for the future of the church, and he's going to pour it out in this moment to make sure that the Gentiles have the possibility of enjoying a future. So he speaks to his fellow heritage Jewish people, and he says this, so why are you, the heritage Jewish sect, loading these new believers down with rules that crushed our ancestors and crushed us too? It's fascinating. He's saying, guys, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Why are we trying to take our past and put it on the future, those people who are coming, the Gentiles? Why are we trying? We couldn't, we couldn't keep these commands. Why are we trying to put it on them? It's such courage, leveraging all of that for the future. And then James, the half-brother of Jesus, he stands up in this moment, and he says these words. He says, we, we, the existing, those already at the table, should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. This is the only reason I'm here today. 
This is what caused the message of Jesus to expand among the Gentiles, that now uh, billions of people globally know Jesus, is because they made this decision in this moment to allow their past to fuel the future, not anchor to their past. Beautiful moment, incredible moment there. Now, we all have biases. Many of us have a bias towards the past. Some of us have a bias towards the future. So wh- what do you think my bias is? <laughs> I, listen, if my wife Shelly was sitting next to me right now or, or my two boys, they would tell you my bias because it's easily the past. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the most sentimental and nostalgic of all of us. I collect things that Shelly's always trying to throw out, but I remember when I had this... <laughs> My boys know music from the 80s and 70s and uh, why? And 90s, why? Because I play it all the time because I love the past. I have a bias towards it. I love the past. You know I'm a history-loving, nostalgic person. And this may surprise some people because you, in the church, you've seen me lean forward. Uh, I've initiated a lot of change in this church that I love. Uh, and that change has been fueled from our past. You know, when I think about our past, I can't help but think of people like Pastor Stuart Mulligan. And, you know, what a privilege to have served with him. What a privilege to have known him. And he's with the Lord now. But when I think of Pastor Mulligan, and I can't, think of, I can't help but think of people like Arthur Windsor and John Bernard and Richard Oliver. And some of you may not even know those names. But they were a group of leaders in the church in a different era that demonstrated such bravery, courage, and faith. And I can't recreate church like Pastor Mulligan led because that error doesn't even exist anymore. But the things that they embodied then can fuel the future faith of our church. I love, I love our past. I think of our more recent past. I think of our teaching pastor, Keith Smith, and he's gonna kick off this brand new series next week, uh, Stranger Things. Uh, you know, I, I, I remember well, 21 years ago, probably uh, longer than some of you have been alive listening today, 21 years ago, I stepped into this church to join Pastor Keith's team. Uh, you know, I would t- tell you to this day, I've said it often, uh, I think Pastor Keith Smith was one of the best lead pastors in our nation, easily, easily. Uh, innovative, creative, strategic, pastoral, but I got to tell you, the best thing I, loved about, I love about him the most is I've always been impressed with his humility. He's just been a humble leader trying to do what's best for Christ church. You know, the thing I think I love most about him, is he doesn't even know what makes him special. <laughs> this is what I love about him. Because he's so focused on serving others that, that you have to help him understand why, what makes him so different. Why did he, was he such a great leader? Well, all of these people have fueled the future of our church. I, I, I think of these statements just before we move into our five bold moves. We're fueled by our church's past, but we can't be controlled by it. See, when I talked about how we have a bias, people who live in the future, what will be, you can tell by their language. They always say, someday, someday, when I get to, I'm going to, and their future living, their language betrays that. People who live in the past, their language betrays it. It's usually language around control or language around protecting or slippery slope language because they're trying to control the future because it's fear-based more so. Listen, we can't be controlled by our past, but we certainly should be fueled by our past. Here's a second thought. We're inspired by past innovations, but we should not try to replicate them because you need present innovations to meet present problems. Past innovations remind us that the church has always been dynamically changing and moving and and adjusting to reach and meet present reality problems and challenges. And here's the last one. We should be thankful for what God has done in the past, but we need to remember what's happened in our past is not nearly as important as what's in our future. How can I say that? Well, listen, not only has Pastor Keith Smith said that, I remember a a video interview that Pastor Keith had with Pastor Stuart Mulligan, one of the last we had here in our church. And I loved, he ended his his interview with Pastor Mulligan saying, uh, Pastor Mulligan said, the best days of the church are ahead of it. And we got to believe that. 
we got to lean in believing that the, the windshield of this church, what's laying before us, has greater opportunity and even grander moments than what lays behind us. So that kind of moves us into our five bold moves. And in fact, Pastor Matt and Jerry have already joined me on stage. And I want to have a conversation with these two guys about the five bold moves that we as a team have discerned together that, that we feel God is leading our church in over the next three to five years. And this is challenging, but welcome, Jerry. Welcome, Matt. We're glad you're here. And we want you to know, too, we're six feet apart and we're all fully vaxxed. Everyone's fully vaccinated here, and we want to encourage you to be, too, as we come back into physical gatherings. But welcome, guys. Thanks for joining me today. Good to be here. So we want to talk about five bold moves, and uh, Jerry, I'm going to look to you for the first one. Uh, As we prayed and discerned, and we went through a long process to determine what was God saying to us in this season, the first bold move is this. We want to reach a million people digitally in Toronto every year over the next three to five years. Jerry, how are we going to do that? Yeah, you know, we're, uh, we're blessed as a church. Uh, you know, we, we have such a great church community and a generous church, and we have the opportunity to reach people that maybe some of our smaller churches wouldn't be able to do, but we all play different roles. And that's the beauty of being part of the One Church TO family is that we have the staff, the technology, and the resources for us to go out and connect and engage and reach a million people in Toronto. Now, how would we go about doing that? Well, you know, there's that little device that's probably right beside you right now. Maybe (laughs) it's in your pocket. Maybe you're watching this right now at home using that device, and that's your mobile phone. And we have the opportunity through new technologies, through Facebook, Instagram, and many others, uh, other platforms for us to reach out and have a conversation with the people who don't know about Jesus. That conversation could come in many different forms. It could come through an invite to one of these gatherings, similarly to what you're watching right now. It could come to an invitation to a group like Alpha, or even be part of a Love Army challenge. What if that was a first opportunity that someone saw uh, something about us as a One Church Seal family, and they saw what? What is this church doing? Wow, that is pretty awesome. I want to be part of that. And that's how we're going to reach out to people through the digital space and then invite them into smaller spaces to have further conversations. So, Jerry, uh, there's a tension between the past and the future, but there's also a tension in church world between big and small, because that's a big vision. It is, yeah. And, uh, but there's individuals, and I think of Jesus. Jesus elevated the individual when he talked about leaving the 99 to pursue the one. Yep. But then he would tell his disciples to go into all the world and make disciples <laughs> of everyone. It was a big and small vision, and we're to live in that tension. How are we navigating that between the individual and this big number of a million people? When you, when you say it that way, it sounds like Jesus wanted it all. And uh, (laughs) when I think about that, you know, that's the role that we can play too as a One Church Seal family. You know, think about the people in your community. You can speak to them. That's on a one-to-one basis. In the digital space, we're going to be casting a large net. So we're going to be spreading that message as far as we can, as far as our resources can possibly you know, do. And then as they get closer, as people show interest, and you know, in the digital world, we say as they raise their hand and they show interest, then we can bring that to a smaller space. That smaller space might be a group. That smaller space might be a gathering. Mm. That smaller space might be even a conversation with one of you, actually, in your community and in your neighborhood. That's so good. So we want to, over the next three to five years, reach one million Torontonians annually through digital media. And uh, the second one is we want to blow open the doors of this church to our local community. There's also a tension that exists between global and local that you see in scripture. And there certainly was in Acts 15 we were just talking about. Pastor Matt, talk to us what it means to blow open the doors to our local community using this facility to affect the region right around us in our physical church space. For sure. We, we were just sitting here for a moment and reflecting on this, this space that we have. It, there was a, a community of faith 
and uh, with faith and vision that built this physical building for the generations ahead of them. And we want to be good stewards of that. This, this is an amazing facility and it's rare in this area. And so, you know, even before COVID, like many churches, throughout the week, there was many rooms that were empty. We have peak moments on weekends where it's very full all, all throughout the building. But then throughout the week, there was moments where there was a lot of rooms that, that were empty. And, and this is natural. This is for, for churches, they have peak moments. But we were thinking, what if we could fill up the rooms and, you know, really be good stewards of the entire space? And we're not just talking about filling it up with stuff. We don't want to just have good storage, good use of storage space. And we're not just talking about filling it up with our community. We're talking about filling it up with the community, our neighbors, our friends, those who live around us, our community. And that's what we're, that's what we've actually already started pre-COVID in a few different ways. We had the privilege of actually hosting a local high school in their convocation, their, their graduation ceremony in this room. And that was so cool to have our community here in our, in our room. We do it uh, weekly with our food bank. We have our community present experiencing something that helps them in a tangible way every week. And we want to do this increasingly. So how can we do that? You know, we, want, we imagine this, this entire building as the third space for you and, and, and those in your life. You know, your, your work, your school, home, those are your first and second spaces where you spend most of your time. But we need a third space where we develop friendships, where we are healthy, where we do things that we enjoy, where we experience that third kind of area of activity. And we have a facility that can do that. We want this to become that place increasingly. We want increasingly this to be a place where you can invite your friends, invite people, where you can say that, come with me. We increasingly want visitors who enter the building, whether it's for a gathering on a weekend or maybe just for an event, you know, walking around the building, experiencing something there, they t- get a first taste of a Jesus-loving community. Maybe they didn't even expect to experience that. So here's a couple examples that we're thinking about. Imagine just in the middle of a week, uh, um, a mom being able to show up with her, her young child and experience some community on an adult level and as well as her child being able to have an experience with other children, and for there to be a moment just of reprieve there for a mom to, to talk to another adult. Uh, imagine this, uh, uh, a senior who's feeling cooped up in the winter, being able to head out to the church building with a couple friends, maybe they don't even know Jesus, and just walk around our building. You know, we see it in the malls often, but what if this could be a space? We've got a great lap. <laughs> this is, there's a circular floor here. Imagine them taking a stroll here in the mornings throughout the week and developing some community with others in their stage of life. That's the type of vibrant community experiences that we increasingly want to see. And you know, as we do that here in this physical local campus, we know that we are going to develop a health here that helps us to increasingly do stuff with a global impact as well. We've already seen this. You mentioned this, Jonathan, healthy local gatherings on on weekends were what birthed our, you know, international. I saw someone in the chat room just recently saying that they're on a different continent. Right. We're experiencing that on a a global level. We want to see the same thing with the rest of our facility. So five bold moves. First one, over a million Torontonians annually touch digitally with the message of Jesus. The second one, to blow open our doors of our facility to our local community. And the third one is to increasingly make our places and spaces sticky, sticky. Think of sticky things, sticky for the next generation. Matt, talk to us about what that means. Because you have two young boys. Jerry, you have two, three young girls. We know and sticky. Three young we girls. know yes. sticky. Yeah, you, you, you may know <laughs> sticky. But what do we mean about a fresh vision to make this even stickier for the emerging generations? Yeah, I think every parent can think of sticky quite easily. Anytime you have syrup on the table, it happened at our family yesterday. Things other than the pancakes get sticky <laughs> for some reason. Uh, you know, for us, we, we want it to be that uh, elementary, preschool, high school, you know, post-secondary, e- emerging into the workplace, those in that age group that they, they, they can't imagine missing out on One Church TO, that this is a place where they, they feel they belong. It's their church already. We're not talking about when they become an adult. We're talking about now. It's not just their parents' church. It is their church. 
And you know, we've heard this a little bit, but we increasingly want this to be a space where kids are dragging their parents to church because mm. they have to go. You know, they're waking their, their parents up and saying, hey, don't miss it. Church is about to go online. Come on, come on, get the TV going for me. We want that to be what this space is like. And we also know it's what Jesus wants. One of, one of Jesus' followers, Matthew, records this moment where there's a ministry moment happening around Jesus with adults. And there's some parents who really want their kids to experience ministry with Jesus, moments with Jesus, closeness to Jesus. And they're pressing in, trying to get at it. And some reasonable adults say, this isn't a kid's program. And what is Jesus' response? He says, let the children come to me. And so we want to say that as a community. We want to say, let the children come. But how do we do that? By intentionally designing are multi-generational moments to include stuff for the next gen. So they say, oh, this is for me. This isn't just my parents involved. This isn't just my parents' content. This is stuff for me too. You know, we, we did this a few weekends ago with our next gen and gathering team working together when we celebrated our Gen Z uh, generation that's present with us. And that was, that was awesome. We also want to intentionally include the next gen by designing spaces, environments, that are custom tailored to them, where they can see, oh, this was built for me. You know, we took steps towards this a few years ago when we designed our kids' wing. And it is one of the coolest kids' spaces in a church that I've ever seen. We are privileged to have that. We want to increasingly make this entire facility one where kids say, hey, this is a place I want to be, where they're dragging their, their parents and their, and their family to it. But not just in physical spaces. We're talking about our digital spaces as well. We want to make our digital spaces increasingly exciting for our kids to show up. And we've got some plans that are, are launching in, in the coming months that we are really excited about how our digital spaces can take some new steps forward in engaging our kids. That's going to be really exciting. And a reminder, by doing this locally, we're, uh, digitally and physically, we're doing this locally and globally. You know, we have kids meeting with us from, from all over the place because we're doing this. And... Uh, when we look back, how will we know we are successful? You know, Jerry and I are sitting here as products of One Church TO's kids, youth, uh, young adults ministry. We've experienced that and we're, we have the privilege to serve the church as leaders right now. Uh, I have two kids of my own, like Jonathan mentioned. We, we, can't, we can't make a gap here. We can't gap on this. Not just because of the future of our organization de depends on it, because uh, a generation needs to experience Jesus for themselves, just like Jerry and I did. This church made space for me to experience Jesus for, for myself in expressions that felt alive and relevant to me. And I, not only they just made space for me in a corner, I was cheered on. I was welcomed. I was brought in. I was allowed to take part in what we were doing as a church. And that's what helped me. And, you know, we are so committed to this for the next generation. So, one million Torontonians digitally every year. We want to blow open the doors of this local facility to service our community, that they have a space where they might experience Jesus and community. And we want to make this place and our vision increasingly sticky for emerging generations. And uh, Jerry, I'm going to look your direction because the fourth bold move is kind of building on something we did in the middle of COVID. Yep. And that is to continue to be unignorably good to the city of Toronto. Yep. And this has been so inspiring to many other churches and movements across Canada that many are talking to us right now about how can they get in on the Love Army. Right. So Jerry, talk to us about Love Army. How can we become more unignorably <laughs> good than what we've already yeah. been doing as a church community? Well, you know, I just, I just want to start by thanking uh, the Love Army for your generosity. And I know some of you are setting your generosity goals for this new year, uh, but thank you for all of the acts of goodness that you've done over the last year. Uh, church family, we're coming up to our one-year anniversary for the Love Army, and you know, I'll, I'll let it slip out there a little bit. Uh, we're probably going to be in that 29,000-ish range of acts of goodness to the city of Toronto. Hey, if you're watching right now, pull up your phone, go into the app, and throw in your acts of goodness that you've done over the last month. You know, if you've missed something, throw it in there. But 
you all know that we are on a mission to do 100,000 acts of goodness to the city of Toronto over the next five years. Now, we've already started on that path, and we're going to keep going. You know, there are other churches who are interested in joining along with us. There are other people who want to help us along in that mission. So they're going to jump on board with us, and we're going to keep going as far as we can go. The Love Army, someone asked in the chat room, are we done at the end of the five-year term? We're not done. The Love Army is who we are. We are here to show love to others. It's what Jesus called us to do, and we're going to continuously do that. You know, talking about opening the church this October 10th, this Thanksgiving weekend, we're going to be kicking right back into our first challenge where we kicked off the Love Army with, which was the shoebox, a uh, pack of shoebox challenge. So when you're coming to church, expect on your way out to be grabbing a few shoeboxes, and we're going to go right back into that challenge and keep adding those numbers to impact children globally, but also show love locally in terms of using our hands uh, to get the work done. Thanks, Jerry. So 1 million Torontonians digitally per year to blow open the doors of our building to the local community, to make this uh, church increasingly sticky to emerging generations, to continue to be unignorably good to the city of Toronto. And our last major bold move that we want to do over the next three to five years is to increasingly champion justice the Jesus way. Uh, this last year, we've, we've all seen and experienced just the hardship and the heartache of injustice racially in this world. And certainly, even more recently, as it's come to light increasingly of the plight of indigenous people in Canada, well, Jesus' heart breaks for that. Jesus is for justice. And we want to do justice to the Jesus way. And we as a church are continuing conversations. Uh, Jerry and I have been in conversations, extended conversations with First Nation leaders across Canada as we're exploring, how can we come alongside you? What, what do you need? Uh, what can we give from what God has placed in our hands? How can we ge be generous to help you forward the mission of helping people enter into the good life, to be able to experience Jesus for who he is, and, and not, not just religion, which can be oppressive and even, even sometimes destructive. How do we increasingly make this a fairer world? Listen, we're, we're not under some sort of illusion that, that before Jesus comes, everything will, we can make everything right. But we need to at least uh, lean in as a community to champion, injustice, uh, to champion justice the Jesus way, to stand up against the systemic racism and poverty and sexism and, and all of those things that exist in the world that toxify the world. We want this to be a better place for your kids. And we're going to do our best to live that out with five bold moves. Thanks for listening. If you found this helpful, we hope you join us at one of our campuses if you're in the GTA for a weekend gathering. If you're listening from somewhere else in the world, we'd encourage you to join us at onechurch.to slash live. We believe everyone can be a part of what Jesus is doing both in our community and in our city. So if you'd like to connect with us at a deeper level, visit us at onechurch.to slash next steps. See you next time.